Okay, it is 7.34 p.m. on Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present um, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. Steve Revlak. Here. Thank you. And Sean O'Rourke is unavailable this evening. Um, so from the town side, we have Rick Valarelli is with us. Here. And Vincent Lee. Here. And I believe that's it from the town side. I don't think anyone else is joining us. And then appearing on behalf of uh, 190, 192 Mystic Valley Parkway, John Peluso. Yes, here. sir. Fantastic. Um, persons appearing for 4143 Fairmont Street. Yes. Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Yes. And persons appearing for 59 Mount Vernon Street. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. <clears throat> this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period for each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference other participants are participating by computer, audio, or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care not to share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Uh, so we are starting this evening with an administrative item, which is just the approval of the minutes from the March 16th, 2021 public hearing. Um, this item relates to an operation of the board and as such will be conducted without discussion by the general public. The board will not take up any new business, nor will there be any introduction of new information on matters previously brought before the board. Uh, so the minutes from March 16th, 2021, those were distributed by Rick Valarelli to the board. Um, I know I had submitted some comments. I don't know if anyone else has additional comments to provide back to Mr. Valarelli at this time. Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. <clears throat> Quick roll call vote, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Revlak? Aye. The chair votes aye. Brings us to the next item, <clears throat> which is a comprehensive permit hearing for 1165R Mass Ave. As noted on the posted agenda, the applicant has requested a continuance to April 13th, 2021 to allow them additional time to review comments received from the board's peer review engineering consultants beta group and from the conservation commission. We will hear no testimony on 1165 R Mass Ave this evening. Uh, the board is in receipt of the request in the form of a letter dated March 22nd, 2021. Are there any questions from the board in regards to the continuance? Seeing none, may I have a motion to continue to a date certain? So moved. Second. Thank you. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. 
Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. <clears throat> so this brings us to the public hearing on uh, 16162 Mystic Valley Parkway. Um, before I go into the rules on it, I understand, Mr. Bavuso, that you are requesting um, a continuance on this. Uh, that's correct, sir. I had some te technical difficulties with my computer, and I do ha not have all of the documents assembled for tonight's meeting. I apologize. So okay. How much additional off. time do you require? Um, April 13th would be fine if we could do that. Does the board have any, any objection to adding this to the April 13th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to continue to the date certain of April 13th, 2021? Seventh moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 191-92 Mystic Valley Parkway. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now turning to the, to the first public hearing on tonight's agenda, there are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct for tonight's business. After I announce, <clears throat> excuse me, each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. So at this time, the first item is somewhere in my stack of papers. Number 3652, which is 4143 Fairmont Street. So if the applicants can make themselves known um, and tell us what you would like to do. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Nolan from Savoy Nolan Architects and I'm here representing uh, Craig Brisbois and Eric and Ashley Brisbois. They're the owners of 4143 Fairmont Street in Arlington. And uh, am I able to share my screen? Is that okay if I share my screen? I've got some images. Mr. Valorelli, can you take care of that? We can do that. Give me a second, Bill. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay, great. Uh, can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so we're looking to do a uh, renovation to um, uh, 4143 um, Fairmont Street. This is the existing um, photograph of the existing front facade. You can see it's an existing two and a half story building, with an unfinished attic and an unfinished basement. This is the front. This is Fairmont Street here. And this is the rear. This would be the par parking lot there. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to jump around a little bit um, in my presentation here and just kind of the interest of keeping things as brief as possible. Um, this is the existing site plan, Fairmont Street here. There's an existing uh, paved driveway that runs to the back of the building, a paved area back there for parking. Uh, on the left side, if you're looking at it from the street, this is a grass strip right here. Uh, the existing building noted here, a rear stair a front porch and stair. Moving on to the existing, I'm sorry, proposed site plan. Um, we're looking to do a renovation um, that, that exists uh, entirely within the existing footprint, the exception of the front covered porch, which we're, we're reducing um, slightly by about 16%, uh, 16 square feet, sorry. Uh, and, and proposing to shift the stairs um, uh, to a more central um, location centered on the covered porch, um, but they'll remain uh, the same exact size. So the project is actually getting a little bit um, smaller. Um, 
the proposed model here, uh, we're seeking to do overall project description is we're looking to um, uh, renovate an, un, an existing unfinished attic um, and also renovate an, an existing unfinished basement. It also includes some minor um, uh, renovation, interior renovation work uh, to the two main living levels, uh, the first apartment and uh, the first floor and the second apartment at the second floor. And um, lastly, a, uh, a, new, uh, a new porch with, a, with an office above it. So um, uh, that's the goals of the project. Why we're here before you guys is uh, because of the existing uh, non-conforming nature of the property. Uh, it's it's, it's non-conforming in, in um, quite a few things, uh, lot size, frontage, uh, side setbacks. Uh, but the reason why we're before you tonight is the uh, open space, um, usable space. Um, the ex and it's an existing non-conforming uh, with regards to the the uh, GFA of the usable space. Um, the existing land, what's required is 30%, which uh, based on the lot size would be roughly 1,200 square feet of usable land. Uh, the existing property has uh, about 20%. Um, and so we're at about 823. Uh, what we're proposing to do with the, the, um, the porch uh, reduction will actually bring us up to 21%. So a pretty minor um, uh, increase, but it's an increase <clears throat> of the, the lot area. Um, so the net total will be uh, about 839 square feet. Uh, this uh, site plan here actually uh, uh, demonstrates the calculations. Um, the gray area, the light gray area is what we're considering um, open space in the GFA. Um, we're um, most properties in, on, on, on the street, um, we have, uh, we're not allowed to include uh, pavement, anything that a car can go over. Uh, so the driveway and the parking lot in back um, takes a significant chunk of the, um, of the um, open space away. But we're not proposing to increase the footprint in any way. In fact, we're decreasing it a little bit on there. Um, that's the reason why we're before you. That's a brief summary of what we're looking to accomplish. Um, so I don't take too much more of your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. Uh, questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, under the zoning ordinance definition of usable open space, you need to have basically a 25 uh, square, uh, 20 foot five foot square on each side. And if I look at the gray area here, I don't see that. The, it looks like it's 13 point, there's 13 feet one inch or 13.1 feet um, back from the, from the property line. And uh, I'm not sure that that under the technical definition of usable open, open it's long enough on the side, I think, uh, but I'm not sure that under the technical definition of usable open space you have any and i wondered if you can explain what your thinking is in uh, treating this as usable open space it's not necessarily to your advantage for it to be usable open space actually so uh but i'm interested in, in seeing how you explain it uh yeah so uh un unfortunately this is uh although i i do present and um, before a lot of zoning boards in different towns and used to sit on uh, the zoning board in my own town, this is actually a new, um, a, a new uh, bylaw for me. So it was, uh, it's probably just a lack of understanding the, uh, the definition of the open space. We read it to be, and I was, I was frankly more concerned with, with which wasn't in, included in, in open space obviously building area and anything that, um, that uh, would have a car drive over it or give an area. Um, I guess I didn't look at it close enough to the nuances and, and, and the distances. Um, with that said, though, this is an, uh, this is an existing condition. Um, so I was basically highlighting anything that wasn't pavement or structure. 
and I apologize if it, if it's if it uh, if it doesn't meet the true definition of open space, then that's just uh, you know a lack of understanding. Thank you. Any further, Mr. Hamlin? Nope. Uh, Miss, Mr. Revelak, Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelak. Yeah, I, I do have a few questions. Um, so yes, the our, our definition of usable open space is a little different than what I've seen in the bylaws of neighboring communities. Um, you know, there is a requirement for, you know, that the area be flat, be free of parking and be vehicular traffic, and also to have a minimum horizontal dimension of 25 feet. Um, you know, and in addition, the the percentage requirement is not based on the size of the lot. It's based on the uh, size of the growth. It's based on gross floor area. Okay. Um, similarly, for landscaped, what uh, what I see on the great the diagram uh, that we're looking at uh, that shaded in gray would I mean to me quali meets the definition of landscaped open space. Yep. I'm wondering if you know the square footage of the gray area. Uh, yes, uh, I believe it's 839. Okay, and so the, the requirement there is 10% of GFA, and uh, it looks like your finished GFA was uh, about 3,127 square feet? Yes. So you're, okay, so in, in that case, um, you I would believe be well, we meet that. You would be well over the 10%. That, yeah, that uh, was my question. About double, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I actually, I'm sorry, if I could interject, uh, just to go back to mm. Mr. Hanlon's question, I think I understood that, uh, the 25 feet, we, we did read this and it's been a little while. Um, uh, we, we submitted this and, uh, and I had uh, some back and forth with the, um, with the building inspector. So when we calculated this, it was, um, quite a while ago, but I believe I, I thought that the 25 horizontal was in either direction. So the front, the frontage, I, I think that's mm -hmm. how I read it. And that's why I considered it open, open space, but um, the I guess board, I didn't read it. Yeah, yeah the, the board certainly has a precedent that, and because this is, as you noted, a, a constant essentially throughout East Arlington, yeah. um, that very few houses actually have any usable open space at the time they <laughs> come before the board for anything. Um, and so the board has taken the position on multiple projects that um, if you have zero use, your zero percent usable open space and you um, decrease that to zero usable open space that is not um, <laughs> considered a change under the, uh, making it more non -com that is not making it more non-compliant. Okay, um, I got it. Than it already is. If you had a nice big backyard and you paved it, that would be an issue, but. That is, that is not the case before us today. Right, thank you. Um, I was curious if, um, if anybody had mentioned to you the residential design guidelines that the town of Arlington has adopted. Uh, yes, is this in regard to this half story? So, well, the, not necessarily to the half story definition, which is in the zoning bylaw, but there's a, a set of residential design guidelines that the town adopted at the end of last year. Um, that um, provides some, um, some guidelines for um, redevelopment of residential property in town, including um, dormer additions, including changes to front facades and such. Um, and uh, this was, um, there was a memorandum that came out from the, uh, from the planning department that came out on March 18th. Were you, have you received that? I did not, no. Go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and share this with you quickly. The second paragraph, I think you have addressed through um, some additional documentation that was presented that was presented to the board today. Um, uh, 
So I think let me go just go ahead here to the second page. Um, so it's this question about the criteria six. Okay, so if I understand that correctly, um, we're looking to push the dormers back. So the, so I'm just going to switch here to the. So this is the residential design guidelines um, document from the town, and um, where's the. I'm looking for section C1. Um, what did I hear about the massing of ah, dormers and roof elements? That's what I'm looking for. So, one of the things the town is looking to do is to sort of reduce. Some of the overall massing of third story additions, um, particularly ones that give the building more of a three story feel than a two and a half story feel. Um, Okay. Um, so I, I did not receive these. We reached okay. out to um, Mr. Uh, Tampa, and I'm sorry okay. if we uh, if I'm mispronouncing his name, uh, the building inspector, mm -hmm. on, um, on a few different occasions. Um, and uh, on, a, on his last email, I was under the impression that we met definition of a uh, half a story. Um, I believe you definitely, uh, by the documentation you provided today, you do meet that definition. Okay. Um, I think that the question that's before the board is, so the looking at the proposed structure, um, what used to be an open porch with a deck above is now infilled at the second floor level, um, okay. which, are, which brings this piece of massing here out in front of the building wall into the front yard. Um, and with the dormers being added to both sides, the full length of the building to the outside face of the outside wall. I think the question is, does this level of massing, is this in keeping with what the residential design guidelines are requesting in terms of maintaining the proportion of massing um, and keep trying to keep the within the context of the neighborhood. Um, there are some shed dormers in the neighborhood. There are some shed dormers that are on both sides, but they really are of limited scale. Um, they really are not the full length of the house. Um, there is one other house in the street that has enclosed over the front porch. Um, I would ask Mr. Valorelli if there are any issues with building this where it's in front of the front wall of the, the house itself. Mr. Valorelli. Hi, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I was, yeah. I was muted. So if he's building on the original footprint of that front porch, then he's okay to go to second floor. Okay. He's expanding it. He is not. And then and there's another, whoops, shoot. Let's close the one document I wanted. Mr. Chairman, before we leave that last picture, the 
the the report, yeah, this, I wanted to sort of, one of the things that the, play, the planning department report does is suggest aligning the windows on the dormer with the windows of the house. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we haven't talked about uh, before either, but that also is one, would they recommend doing that or moving the dormers back some from the, from the side? And I think that I'd like to hear what what Mr. Nolan has about that says about that recommendation. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. Actually, I um, agree 100%. If, I'm sorry if we could go back to the uh, that elevation. I could show it on my screen. But yeah, that one. We can certainly um, we can certainly uh, align those windows. They appear to be off about a foot. Um, I, I don't think that that's. Mm -hmm. um, it's too difficult to, to organize that so that they can stack above the uh, the windows. That's an easy, easy fix. Um, I'm looking at the side southwest elevation. Um, we could we could take another pass at um, walking around the building. I believe the ones in the front do align or you know complement. We go to a double window over uh, over a bay, but it's centered in the same way that it's centered. Um, so, um, if we want to go from um, from elevation to elevation, we can certainly align um, um, more windows than what we're showing. Yeah, uh, in some cases we won't be able to. So for example, the, the side elevation um, at the bottom of the screen right now, um, that window to the front of the house, um, wouldn't want to push that, the, the higher dormer that close. And, right. and we intentionally you know, held those, the, the larger dormers back. Uh, and those are just so that we can get egress windows into the spaces up there. So there, there was a design intent to, to reduce the scale of the, uh, the dormers to their absolute minimum um, uh, and for the majority of it. And then we punch, punched up uh, in, in certain areas just to allow for natural light into the spaces. Uh, but we can certainly certainly do a um, you know, go through it and, and, and shift the windows so that they align better in, in most cases. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Mr. Howland? Sorry. Yes. Thank you. And then sort of looking at the plan, so the, it, appear, it does appear that, is it, that the addition is set in slightly yep. at the front, it's flush at the back. Correct. Okay. I, I would think that the front would be more, you know, more important to, to get it. Absolutely. We could certainly push that back uh, a little further um, if the if the board has a has a specific dimension in mind, and we certainly entertain that. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Are there any further questions from the board? Seeing none. Um, I will now open the meeting for public comment. Um, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand, should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time for their comments and they can have additional time at the discretion of the chair. The chair will ask members of the public who have logged in through Zoom who wish to speak to raise their hand using the button on the participants tab in the Zoom application. Those calling you by phone, if you dial star nine, it will indicate that you'd like to speak. You will be called upon by the host. You may unmute your audio and you'll be asked to give your name and address. And you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed. And if you would like the board or staff to show any documents, um, please let us know. So are there any members of the public who have questions or comments? I see Mr. Seltzer is waving his hand. Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, I'd like to call the board's attention to 
section 5.3.9 of the bylaw projections into minimum yards. Um, from my reading of it, it seems that section B of that um, says that the existing unenclosed steps in the front um, are perfectly acceptable, but C would suggest that putting in a second story addition that projects further into the front yard setback area would not be allowed. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, Mr. Valerelli, I know this question has, has come before the board before as well. My understanding is that this is because there's an existing porch that has an existing foundation that that is the point that the building department considers the front, the start of the front yard for the purposes of construction. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So if this porch did not exist and the applicant wished to construct the porch of this size, it would not be allowed. It would only be allowed by special permit, but because it's a pre-existing non-conforming condition, um, he is allowed to have a second story as long as he doesn't encroach any closer to the front yard setback than he already is. Uh, one other point, um, more positive nature. I'm wondering if the rear roof deck can be counted um, towards the usable open space. Towards um, usable open space, I wouldn't think so because the um, the area is too small. And well, I believe I, I, all of it, but uh, um, so, I, I some, think it's a height issue. Mm -hmm. oh, because it's more than 10 feet above the yeah, the lowest floor. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. We, we did consider that. We did look at it. And I believe um, after speaking with the building inspector, it was a moot point uh, because of the height. Yeah, I know it has to be 10 feet no more than 10 feet above the lowest dwelling level. I wasn't sure if that meant the floor of the lowest dwelling level or you know, the, the top of the lowest dwelling level. So you're saying the interpretation is that it can be no more than 10 feet above the floor of the first floor. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Right now it's the first floor is at uh, elevation, is considered elevation zero here and the first, the attic that porch is at 18 feet above that. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Seltzer. Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, quick question related to, again, the, um, the, the front porch and the second story over the front porch. Um, a question for Mr. Valerelli uh, through the board. If um, if these, if the front porch, front porch, if this was just stairs, meaning you have a front door and you have a concrete block with no roof over it, just uh, uh, you walk out your front door onto the concrete block down the stairs and you're in your front yard and on the street, on the sidewalk. Is that legal to build a second story on top of that when there is no roof or front porch over those stairs? Can I answer that question, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Valerelli, please. Yeah, so projections into minimum yards is split for two different scenarios, um, open, open decks or open porches and enclosed. So to answer your question, no, would not be allowed. In a scenario like that, if you had an open set of stairs, all the, particip all the applicant could do was create a vestibule no more than 25 square, square feet in area and no more than three and a half feet off of the line of the foundation. In this case, it's a little different because we're talking about a pre-existing structure that exceeds 25 square feet and is clearly within the front yard setback. So um, in the eyes of the building department, they are not becoming any more non-conforming by adding a second level to that. That's always been allowed. Does that answer your question, Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, yes, I believe so. Um, I would, I would direct, uh, I would direct Mr. Valerie's attention to the what's going up on Hibbert Street near the uh, small park, which is within two feet of the front sidewalk, and they've built a second story over what had been merely exposed stairs, no porch, no roof. Anyway, thank you. 
Thank that, you, Mr. Moore. That should be brought to the attention of inspectional services, Mr. Moore. Say, say again. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Any further public comment on this matter? Quickly scan through the picture, see if there's anybody waving. I see nobody waving. I see no raised hands. So the public comment for this hearing will be closed. So questions for, so for the board, um, we have made some recommendations to the applicant in regards to the layout of the, the building. Um, I guess the question for the board is, do we feel confident in um, making a decision this evening or do we wish to continue to allow the applicant time to, um, to make revisions to the attic floor as we had discussed. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So um, relating back to the observation you had made about people putting dormers on uh, some, in some instances, both sides of a uh, third floor and while maintaining the definition of a half story still, and I think you observed correctly that this looks to be larger because it runs the entire length of the sides of the building on both sides. And so I guess, and it's not something that's a requirement, but it does feel to me like this is substantially larger and it feels to me like it is more like a third floor. At the same time, I understand that it does meet the requirements for uh, being only a half story. So I'm a little bit torn to be honest with you mm -hmm. about that because I think then what we're talking about is the character of the district. And so that would be where I think I would need to consider it more carefully and uh, a, a little additional time for the applicant to consider all of those things that were raised in the planning department's letter um, might be helpful, but that's just for me. Mm -hmm. Other comments from the board? I think I, Mr. I Chairman, I have a, it's, it's a procedural, I mean, to some extent, we are in the position we are because uh, neither the planning department memorandum, nor I gather the design guidelines found their way into Mr. Nolan's hands in a timely way. Um, and I wonder if as we go forward, we might be able to somehow solve that um, by having some sort of a procedure whereby the, that memorandum, I mean, by now, I think everyone experienced with us knows there, sh there usually is such a memorandum and it would, it would have been easier and we would be less in a quandary right now if Mr. Nolan had not had to not had to, but he did uh, re uh, reply on this on, on, the, on the fly. Um, the same thing is sort of true. I think that everyone knows that the design guidelines to be really ef effective need to be in people's hands and, and architects like Mr. Nolan are exactly the sort of person who really ought to be sure that he has this sort of thing. It's new and we're working hard at, at making sure it is in people's hands. And again, I think for us, we need to be thinking about particularly where, where they are potentially involved, but maybe it's just routinely making sure that applicants know that, I mean, they can download it from, it's on the web, uh, know that they should look at that. 
Um, so we may want to consider our own procedures to increase the chances that people will do that, and that these and that the proceedings will won't won't fall into a sort of a of, of a hiccup uh, because of the uh, because the people have not not the applicants may not have be playing with a full deck when by the time they get here because they haven't gotten all the documents. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, please. Um, I should have noticed this before, and I apologize for just not bringing it up. But when you calculate the area of the third floor, the area, did I read correctly, is calculated to be 500 and some feet, square feet, that you've calculated is the, is the, um, on the third floor? Uh, give me a second. I, uh, let me just find that. 554, yes. So if you go to the plans on the third floor and you just add up the, the measurements of the room, I mean, it does feel like more than a half story, but when you actually just add up the, the areas that you are calling for each bedroom, walk-ins, bathrooms, and storage, I mean, that those numbers don't jive. So I'm trying to understand, may, maybe I'm, I'm trying to understand where the 554 comes from. I explain, Mr. Chair. Please do. Yeah. So the um, I pull up a. Uh, uh, would I be able to share on uh, a graphic that I sent to the board earlier this after uh, this afternoon? Is that this one here? Uh, or you can share. <laughs> yes. So um, so basically, what's considered uh, floor area on the second floor is the area that is in the. Um, uh, seven seven foot or greater, um, so that's a that's a bar down the center of the building that's about twelve foot six. The, uh, if you're look if you're referencing the floor plans, there is usable space underneath those that technically don't classify as as uh, floor area because they're below seven uh, seven square feet. So I think if you add up the numbers on the floor plans, they they won't jive. Um, I took a basic definition of the square footage based on the the seven foot height limitation. Anything lower than that is technically declassified. That, that makes sense? No, it, it makes sense. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense. I think maybe it just lends to the credence that this does, when you look at the elevations on the, the dormers, how they pop up, you know, it does feel much doesn't feel like a two and a half story where I understand how technically you're arriving at the two and a half story by the, by the area of, uh, by using the ceiling height of seven feet and not counting the area beyond that. But, but practically speaking, uh, you're using all of that space. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, not to delay this another while, but it would be helpful to, to um, sit on it, continue mm -hmm. it so that we can, um, and, and, and I'll look to you guys because you, you guys have a lot more experience on, on how this compares to several of the others that you've done. But it would be nice to at least have a chance to, to sit on it and compare that the, the fact that it's, it's a practical thing versus um, uh, um, a matter of just calculating a two and a half story, but really they're using the whole story as a, as a third floor. Yeah. yeah Mr. You. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, it, it just to me, it seems to me that we have to recognize that, <clears throat> that what the issue in front of us is the ap applicability of criterion number six. Uh, the zoning bylaw has been met here, uh, or at least I'm assuming that it has been met. And so the question is whether or not uh, this design and this use is would adversely affect the integrity or character of the zoning district. Zoning district. Um, and as a practical matter, I would like, in order to come to a conclusion that it would, knowing what the massing is by itself wouldn't necessarily be dispositive for me. The, the key is what happens in the area. 
And my understanding is that, that this is not an established pattern yet on Fairmont Street, but we know that it is a pattern that exists throughout the, the neighborhood. Um, and one relevant factor that I'm sure that we all are going to need to look at in order to figure out what we think about this massing issue is how it relates to the prevailing pattern that already exists in the neighborhood. If everybody is doing this, then we, then the fact that it seems like it's large massing may not matter very much because it does meet the statutory requirement. On the other hand, if this is out of scale with what has already been introduced into the neighborhood, it introduces a separate set of questions. So I just wanted to focus that the, the nature of the criteria causes us to focus on that question and we need to keep it in our minds. Certainly, and I did spend some time there today looking at the at this structure and at some of the adjacent houses as well. Um, and the, you know, the existing roof line, which they're maintaining here is very prevalent throughout the neighborhood. There are a few houses that do have dormers. There's not that many at this point. Um, there are some that have shed dormers. The one that have shed dormers, they typically are much more of a modest scale. Um, and so this, surely for this area, it is out, of, it, it does feel a little bit out of scale. Um, I was concerned initially about the, the room over the front stair, because I think it does really sort of make the building feel much more like it's encroaching over the street. Um, there is one additional house further down about, I think it's about four doors down that has similar structure to it. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to, how to take, um, but I think based on the, I think the board, I, I would certainly find that based on the, um, the report from the planning commission, um, with regards to the massing and with regards to the, the alignments on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the side elevations and such. Um, I think it would be worthwhile to have uh, the applicant uh, take a look at this, this memorandum from the town and the residential de design guidelines and to um, sort of consider if there are some modifications to the upper floor um, that would be more in keeping with the intentions of the, the residential design guidelines. Mr. Revelock, Mr. Chair. Please. Yeah, the Fairmont Street is a little, in terms of just like the overall massing of the street, uh, in my mind, there is quite a bit of variety to it. For example, uh, two or three doors towards Mass Ave, uh, is a single family, one and a half story building that um, the owner came before us a couple of months ago to do an addition. Next to that, there is a triple decker. A little further down the block, the other way, there is a triple decker. And there are a number of two and a half story, two family homes. So there is, there is a bit of a, there is already a bit of a mix. And you know, the, um, you know, I, perhaps that just makes it all the, all the more subjective. Mr. Chair, it's Ford. Not, not to dwell on the site thing, but I, I feel, I, I guess my, and, and maybe um, my comments mute because he qualifies and it, and it's there's precedent. But if he had held the same ridge height and not changed the ridge, then I would feel much more inclined to, to, to not worry about this feeling like a full third story when he pops up the dormers. But the fact that we're raising the ridge not quite two feet uh, and then taking advantage of the, of the seven foot rule mm -hmm. doesn't feel in, in, in the spirit of, of what the two and a half story in my mind is, whether that's precedent or written in, that, that's the part that feels like it's being turned into a full third story. So I, I don't know. Let me let me ask Mr. Nolan. Have you raised the ridge height on the? Uh, give me one second. I know we're well within the um, a maximum height limitation. Uh, in any case, um, so we're we're about um, a couple feet 
low what the maximum uh, ridge height is. Uh, it appeared from this from the way it was drawn that it was the front the essentially the, the front building wall was the same as at the start. Yeah, I mean, we're going from a, um, a hipped roof to a, a gable roof. So that's mm -hmm. going to add um, the, the um, just, just aesthetically, it adds more volume to the face of it. Because in the existing building, it's tailing away. There's right. a small dormer in the front uh, where this is now a gable. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I uh, I'm reading have... it, Mr. Chair. It's on item 16. It says height of 30.75 going to 32.5. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So yes, uh, I guess we are. Um, however, it is. I'd like to just point out that we're well within the, the maximum uh, height limitation. Mm. About two and a half feet, I believe. Under. Here's that way. Yeah. Okay, so Some of that has to do with, um, I, I, so it's a, it comes even more of a challenge uh, with today's instruction um, with the energy, uh, trying to meet the energy codes. The, the, the roof structures uh, have gotten significantly larger so that we can accommodate the um, the insulation requirements now from the energy code. So where you know, um, I believe this is probably a two by eight or, or potentially, I I'm, can't quite recall, seen houses like this with two by sixes uh, for rafters now have to go to two by tens and sometimes twelves in order to meet the, the, the um, energy requirements. So um, that's one thing that factors into uh, using it up. Okay, so we're so we're turning back to the board. Um, if I'm if I'm reading the board correctly, it sort of sounds like we're looking for um, some additional work on behalf of the applicant before we're ready to make a decision. Um, is there any member of the board who feels we ought to? <clears throat> excuse me. To, to is there anyone who feels we should not? continue on this item. Seeing none. Uh, may I have, I think then we would um, ask, the, ask to continue and ask to then ask Mr. Valarelli if he can provide the applicant with a copy of the um, memorandum from the planning department and a copy of the residential design guidelines, which are available from the planning department's website. I most certainly will, Mr. Chairman. I'll do that right away. Thank you, sir. Um, may I have a motion to continue? Motion to discuss it. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Mills. Motion to continue. Do we need to continue to a date certain? Do we April 13th? Is that the does that date work for everyone? Is that the next available meeting? Um, we have a meeting. Uh, we, ha we have two other meetings, um, but just to, we have a meeting on the 30th and the meeting on the 8th. Um, those are both tied with a comprehensive permit application for uh, Thorndike Place, which is um, the Mugar property. And it, it, those are gonna be very busy nights. Okay. The uh, if the 13th, uh, I just asked to be on the next available one that works with the board. Okay. I have a motion from Mr. Mills to continue, which I would amend to continue to April 13th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And chair votes aye. So we will continue that to April 13th. Thank you very much for coming in this evening. Thank you.
And then the next item on our agenda is item 36539 Mount Vernon Street. So if the, Whitney, if you can introduce your project, please. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, I'm David Whitney. I'm the architect working on this project with the homeowners, Matt Pappas and Mona Scorfano. They're hiding here on the screen as well. Um, they own a beautiful house at 59 Mount Vernon Street with a very large lot. Uh, zoning allows two units on the property. And so we'd like to expand their house uh, to add another unit. Uh, we've submitted drawings, we've submitted calculations. I think we comply in every way with the zone bylaws except for the fact that the area of the proposed addition is greater than 750 square feet. Uh, so we're here to seek a special permit that is required. Thank you. I will go ahead and pull up the plan. This is the existing site plan. Um, The proposed site plan with existing house and the addition. And closer in, so that's the existing basement level, first level, existing second level, existing roof level or attic level, excuse me. And then this is proposed basement level, the two garages facing the rear, first floor. Second floor and attic floor. South elevation. That's looking downhill. That's the rear. Looking uphill. Mr. Klein, let me note that the, the directions on the elevations don't reflect reality, they're convention, <clears throat> which north is up on the page. And I didn't include the, the front street side elevation because the work will be invisible from there. Thank you. Um, so I had some, um, asked some questions and you were kind enough to respond to those. Um, just these questions here. Um, well, about open space. So on the site plan, so this is the existing site plan. So is, is the area of the rear yard, is it essentially flat? It was difficult to tell. It's, 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 you see there's a large paved area there. The area beyond that is, is relatively flat, but sunken. It's lower than the existing paved area. Okay. Is the area of the rear yard flat enough to comply with the requirements the, of usable open space? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the change in the depth of the rear yard. So it's currently 72 feet to the detached garage and that will be 72 feet now to the addition. Rear house, rear the existing house is at 108. Yes. <clears throat> and then the setback. So the the question I had, I think, on the setback was, um, I think it's listed as 10 feet on the plan on the submitted drawings, but it's it's listed as 9.8 on the side. But I don't think it matters because I don't think that the addition is within the 10 feet as a side line. Is that correct? Uh, correct. I'm going to blame the town for that. Um, their PDF <laughs> rounds to the nearest foot. Ah, <laughs> then that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the setbacks. Um, how much of the rear yard needs to be paved to provide access to the rear facing garage? Um, so you had indicated that. Oops, that's the one. So this space is sufficient for the U-turns to get in and out of the garage? Yes, it should be. OK. And then we had asked about the residential design guidelines. Um, 
Monty, you had addressed these. These have been distributed to the board ahead of the meeting. I'm not sure all the board members had an opportunity to see it or not. Um, but there's no real impression upon the streetscape. Um, um, using materials and details that are existing, conforming to the rhythm of the streetscape, matches existing materials, details, window configurations, etc. Going back to the house. Um, I will stop the share here. Are there questions from the board? Mr. Revelak. Uh, just a few questions, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, when I, uh, I took a ride by this weekend and it looks, I see the retaining wall noted on the plans and it looks like the rear yard drops off after the retaining wall. And uh, the retaining wall, it seems like, um, Forget which sheet it mentioned it, but the retaining wall is coming out. Yes. Okay. And so the um, and there is there is enough there is sufficient usable open space on what basically is currently the far side of the retaining wall. Yeah, we call it the back portion of the lot. Okay. And um, and the uh, the new second unit uh, will be two floors rather than two and a half. Correct. Correct. And um, yes, I think uh, I think I think that's all I have. I I agree that uh, from the front, it would you know this would probably this is not going to be very noticeable. It seems like the the front of the building is the facade is is staying uh, essentially the same. I also think it. I mean, it struck me as. You know, it will probably look similar to the uh, building one down the hill. Uh, I guess it would be 51, where it's a it's it's a similar, looks like a two family, but um, you know the same same basic facade as other houses on the street, but just a, a fairly deep structure. Correct. No further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Revlak. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dubont. So I just had a couple of questions about the dimensional and parking information page. And I think some of them are just misprints, but I want to make sure that I understand <clears throat> correctly. So I don't know if you want to put that up, but uh, in the height stories on number 15, I don't know if you can enlarge that at all. But on, on number 15, it says proposed or present condition four stories, and then proposed conditions four stories. And then it says maximum three, but then down in the next line 16, it says it's 35 feet in height. So I just wanted to understand the numbers four that are uh in that. Mr. DuPont, thank you again. That's, around, that's the PDF rounding on me automatically. Um, I think that existing attic floor meets the definition of a half story, but um, it's already tall enough to count as three and a half, uh, okay. and we're not making the building any taller. And similarly, I just wanted to understand in 14, where you have rear yard depth present conditions, 72 feet, and then proposed conditions, 72 feet. And I couldn't tell by looking at the plan, and it may be my lack of ability in reading these things all that well, but is it still going to be 72 feet? It is. I might have been unclear in that. The existing conditions is the setback to a detached garage. It's 72 okay. feet to, to the back of the detached garage. And this, this is in the um, written answers I provided this afternoon. It's actually 108 feet to the back of the main house. I see. Okay. But the addition will go no further back than the existing detached garage. And it looks like in a number 21, it just auto filled. I think it did. Uh, forgive me. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> Would be a big parking lot. <laughs> Would be. Where did that pull that number? From? Oh, it pulled it from the lot size. I don't know why it did that. Oh, that could have been. 
I see other uh, applicants tonight filled out by hand. Perhaps I'll do that in the future. Well, at, a, at a minimum, it looks like I need to edit this form to get it to work correctly. Are there any additional questions from the board? No, 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 no. Okay, so I will now open the meeting for public comment. Um, as before, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purposes of informing our decision. Chair, ask members of the public who have logged in through Zoom who wish to speak, to please digitally raise your hand using the button on the participants tab of the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, you can dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. Be called upon by the host, you'll be, I will un you can unmute your audio and you'll be asked to give your name and address for the record. And you'll be given time for your questions and comments. So first hand I see is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, a question relative to uh, the uh, the plan. I think I just heard that it was not going, the uh, new structure was not going to exceed the depth into the lot uh, beyond the current garage. I was looking at the aerial view and uh, the various tree population that's on the site. <clears throat> I'm wondering if the, uh, the uh, uh, owner or architect has developed a tree plan to deal with any trees that are gonna be taken as part of the project. Mr. Whitney? No, we have not. Uh, okay, do you intend to take trees as part of the project? As required, I, I admit I haven't done an analysis of what trees will have to come down. Okay, um, just be aware that, uh, that I am a member of the tree committee and uh, there's obviously regulations related to taking down trees when there's a, a, a large scale addition uh, under our Arlington tree bylaw. Um, so I suggest you get in touch with the tree warden when you do, after you have made your observations and decisions regarding trees um, and, and approach him about uh, developing the tree plan related to those decisions. His name is uh, um, Tim LaQuive. I don't have this phone number right here. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Moore. Mr. Rosenthal? Am I unmuted? You are. Yes. Um, I just want to point out. Um, uh, just uh, sorry, I have to ask uh, your name and address of the record. Yes. Um, my name is Mark Rosenthal. I'm on 62 Walnut Street. This is the house directly in back of my house. Um, now, there was mention of the house downhill immediately next door um, that that house is just like what's being proposed. I want to point out that what's typical uh, in an Arlington R2 district um, is uh, basically a, a house with either a single entrance or entrances side by side that a to uh, the first floor and one of which goes to the second floor. And that's typical, certainly, on Mount Vernon Street. Um, the house that's next door, I don't remember exactly when it was, maybe 10, 10 years ago, possibly as much as 15, but um, it was expanded uh, from a single family to the current configuration and I do remember having conversations with all the surrounding neighbors at the time, finding that, uh, you know, f feeling that this was really out of character with everything else in the neighborhood. Um, so the statement in the application where it says uh, that the use is in existence all around the property, um, I don't, I don't see that as accurate. Um, this was an extremely unusual design um, that displeased most of the neighbors um, when the house next door was built. And now that seems to be being used as precedent 
to build uh, the same thing uh, you know, next door. So I think that's pretty much what I've got. Thank you. Um, I don't know if, um, Ms. Diamond, I believe you had your, up. Oh, your hand's back up, okay. Ms. Diamond? So I'm Alice Diamond and I live at uh, 55A Mount Vernon Street. We're next door. Um, and given that the size of the house is going to double, I'm wondering why the current requirement of two parking spaces and the proposed requirement, it says there's going to also be two parking spaces. Is that in keeping with the zoning regulations? It is Mr. Valarelli, can you speak to that? I can, Mr. Chairman. So the um, zoning regulations have changed. They've gone to, from uh, two parking spaces per dwelling unit to one parking space per dwelling unit. Okay, well, I just wanna comment that this is um, like a unit with about eight bedrooms with two parking spaces. It just seems kind of questionable to me. Mr. Chairman, can I respond? Yes, Mr. Whitney. Um, Perhaps Mr. Valerelli can help me or anyone can help me. I can't find a good definition of parking spaces on a typical residential driveway or scenario in the zoning bylaws. I know for commercial parking lots, they're very strictly and well-defined. I'm not sure what to call them in a driveway, you know, garage situation. I know we can fit more cars than one per unit, but since one per unit is required, that's what I listed on the table. Mm -hmm. Can I answer that question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Valerelli. Well, Mr. Whitney, I can send you those sections. Uh, what's ap applicable to uh, especially what you are proposing. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goldstein. Hi. Um, I, I live at 29 Albemarle Street on the corner of Mount Vernon down the street from this property. Um, I would like to echo some of what Mark Rosenthal said and more. Um, this house um, is not in character with this neighborhood. And just because there's a front that will look the same along the street doesn't mean that this, is, this design is prevalent in this neighborhood at all. And to me, it is not at all in keeping with the character of the district. And I think Mark Rosenthal is correct that the house next door at 55 is an unusual and very large structure built one house behind the other, which you can see from the street. You see that large, long, double house from the street. So for people to say that this house you wouldn't see this from the street. I don't know that that's true. Um, and this, I, I really feel like this is a misnomer to call this an addition. This is a large uh, massing stuck on behind a house. And I'm concerned that this part of Mount Vernon Street has several large long lots I'm not sure what the origin of all of that was. I'm sure it's got some interesting history, but I would be very concerned if we're starting to view it like all of these long lots can now get a second house stuck behind it, which is called an addition. So I think this really needs a lot more thought. And, you know, there've been several things that have been brought up just now where there's no consideration of a tree plan the architect didn't know what the uh, definition of the parking spaces were. Some of these uh, numbers on the sheets were not uh, correct. Um, Mr. Klein, you apparently had questions that you sought answers to that I don't think were publicly available for the rest of us to see what those were. I, I think this really needs to be rethought. And, and I definitely don't think that the fact that 55 
has a second house built behind it means that we can now just build second houses behind the first ones. I don't know if there's an architectural term for this, but um, I think it's, it's of concern. Thank you for that. Um, as far as the difficulty in navigating the, the form, I will take some, uh, take some credit for that, um, being the one who created the PDF form myself. So I will take a look at it and get that, see if I can figure out what went wrong with that and see if I can get that repaired. Um, and then the, the additional questions that I had posed um, to the applicant, those were posted today to the agenda, but they did come in late this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so I know they were not posted timely. Are there additional public comments? Mr. Seltzer? Yes, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I'm look, looking at the package that was posted and it seems to be lacking in any detailed elevation um, numbers. And I just think the board might want to, I guess that under the table it said that it, presently it's 35 feet high and the new project is going to be 35. I think one problem you run into there is that the land is sloping off towards the rear, which you're gonna build on. So the average grade from which you measure the elevation is now lower. And you might find that uh, the high point of the house is more than 35 feet above the average grade. So uh, I just think that the elevation figures should be properly dimensioned so you can determine that. So Mr. Valerelli, in terms of the, with an addition of this type, the average, the height of the building is average over the entire structure, not just the addition, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Because that similarly, the question would be with the, um, with the increased exposure of the basement level, does that create, a, does that now count as a story? Uh, so again, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is the applicant's first step. He still has a whole list of other things to uh, comply with yeah. that will not require um, board permission. It will either require um, that he adjust the plans accordingly to meet the zoning bylaw. Otherwise, he's going to be back before you. Uh, so tonight, I think he just has to, his hurdle is the addition. The large addition exceeds 750 square feet a host of other things, uh, too numerous to mention, such as the tree warden, uh, stormwater mitigation, uh, height of the building, all of that other dimensional and density stuff uh, has to be, has to uh, comply. Thank you, Mr. Valerelli. Mr. Valerelli, if, if I can ask for clarification, it sounds like you're saying those are things that the project has to meet for the building permit, but what's most critical for the special permit is the 750 square foot rule. That's correct, Mr. Whitney. Thank you. Mr. Seltzer, do you have anything further? Uh, no, I, I just wanna suggest that he probably does meet the parking requirement easily because all of that driveway beyond the front yard counts as off space parking too. So that along with the two garage spaces and uh, they could probably park six or seven, eight cars in legal off street spots. Mm -hmm. um, any further public questions? Mm -hmm. um, seeing none. Um, Chris, Mr. Mr. Klein. May I ask, is there a term for this type of development of sticking a second house behind a first house? Well, the, sort of the, the format of having two houses side by side, this is considered a duplex, I believe, Mr. Valerelli, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. 
and mm -hmm. is is this addressed in the residential design guidelines i see that they have things about additions but mm -hmm. i don't see anything about um sticking a second house behind a first house i, I didn't see anything specific to that they speak a lot about um things that are immediately adjacent to the street um and sort of that kind of massing and the location of garages and open space and uh, you know sort of at the front and be running between properties but there's not a lot in here with regard to rear yards mr chair mr revelack I mean, one of the things that uh, I, and I'm, my apologies, I can't cite a specific se section off the top of my head, but one of the things the residential guideline did advocate for was for constructing additions in the rear yards of buildings uh, to minimize, you know, the visibility of the additional massing from the street. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, you're welcome. Just quickly scanning to see if I see that in the brief. Block category, street facing design elements, creative solutions, range of styles. Streetscape rhythm. Uh, housing elements. Roof lines, dormer, roof elements, windows, detailing. So I'm thinking on dish and specific. <coughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm not finding something readily. Well, again, I would say that. I find this not in character with this neighborhood at all. And I think it is something that needs to be addressed by design guidelines. Um. We're going to, or is it, so the, the memo from the planning department. Um, sort of note that the proposal substantially increase the building, the structure's massing, the addition will be completely within the rear yard of the property. Appearance of the home from the street will not be altered, and the applicants note that the materials selected for the addition are complementary to the existing structure. The proposal is consistent with neighborhood character and is not detrimental to health, morals, or welfare. Um, it's a finding from the planning department. Um, then the recommendations need a determination from the engineering division regarding uh, stormwater runoff. Um, Mr. Chairman? Uh, oh, one second, just flipping through here. Uh, then they mentioned a related document, a uh, related application, which is 20 Beacon Street, um, which was approved uh, in January of 2020. Um, who is it who had? I'm uh, sorry, that, that, that was Whitney. Mr. Chairman. Uh, regarding the, the stormwater runoff, I just wanted to confirm that we absolutely understand that as a requirement and plan to do that as part of the, the general building permit application. Thank you. Anything further, Ms. Goldstein? Um, <laughs> I guess I'm, I just don't understand really how if there are zoning guidelines about the size of an addition, and this is like doubling the size of this house and creating a second house, I, I, I guess I'm just not sure how this is viewed as, you know, just within the, the character of the neighborhood and the district and, you know, I, ideas for not massing. This seems like 
a large massing even though it's behind the house behind the house which the house next to it also has a large massing behind it which you can see from the street and uh, like what mr rosenthal said before it sounds like he has more to say um just because it was allowed 15 years ago doesn't mean every lot on Mount Vernon Street should now get backfilled like that. that that's my concern. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Ford. Um, maybe one of the questions that we can help answer, and, and I, I would look to you board members because I have a similar question which that, that might help um, Ms. Goldstein and the others um, understand why this might be allowed. What is the, uh, what is the intent of this zoning bylaw that limits the as of right addition to 750 square feet? So I think the intention, and, and Mr. Valerio, you can correct me. So the basically the zoning bylaw includes a provision that it for large additions. So if there's an addition that's over 750 square feet, it requires special permit approval. And I believe the intention of that was that if there was to be a large addition made onto a property, that it would require the zoning board to consider it in to apply the the you know the seven criteria that the board is required to apply to a special permit to determine whether or not um, an addition of that size was in keeping with the care with um, excuse me the end those criteria for the for the town. That, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. So you know one of the things that just um, that catches my attention when I read through some of the requirements of the special permit. One is um, uh, the requested use will not create undue traffic conditions, uh, congestion rather. And then the response is, well, changes uh, to traffic will be inconsequential. But that's not, I, I'm not, sh I'm not seeing that that's based on anything other than just maybe an opinion. Um, and kind of the same thing with when um, you apply the, the when when you when the questions asked why the requested use will not overload public water drainage or sewer, and it doesn't even say that it won't. It simply just says as of right. So it simply hangs its hat on the as of right. So mm -hmm. maybe. Um, I, I think I I think I'm I'm a little hung up on why this could simply just be allowed uh, because it feels like it does, it will add traffic and it does increase the drainage of public water, but but because it's as of right, because it was a two story that it, that it goes forward. So that's what brings me back to the question of the intent of the 750 square feet limitation. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chair. Chairman. Mr. Revelak. It happened, this happened to come up during public comments at last Monday's, a week ago, last Monday's, the redevelopment board hearing. So just take this as town hearsay, but apparently back in the 70s, there was a member of the Arlington Select Board. Someone put a big addition next to his house. His next door neighbor put on a large addition. The Select Board member didn't like it. And soon afterwards, we added a special permit requirement or large additions. <laughs> so if that and that's probably a more direct answer. Um, you know, again, this is hearsay during the public comment section of a redevelopment board me meeting, but there you have it. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I have a comment, but first I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Ballarelli. Um, if the property owner here uh, were to decide that instead of putting an addition on the property, uh, he would raise the property. And as I understand it, this is, a not, this is a conforming lot. And so you're not dealing with any of the limitations we've talked about in some other cases. If they, took, if they just raised the house that was currently there and built a house that was essentially the same as the one that he is proposing now, uh, could he do that by right? He could not, Mr. Hanlon, as the property only is uh, contains 49.22 feet of frontage. 
Uh, so by today's bylaw, he would need 60 feet of frontage. So it's a non-conforming lot. That's correct. He does have the area. He does not have the frontage. I see. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, I don't think that the way in which the zoning ordinance is, is set up in terms of additions, it may be helpful just to look at it the other way around. If it's under 750 feet, uh, then it doesn't propose, it doesn't pose any change that uh, needs to come before us. If it's over that, it doesn't mean that there's anything illegal or indeed any, the, even that there is a presumption against it. It just means that we apply the criterion, uh, the criteria that uh, we, that are written into section 3.3 or three of the, of the bylaw, which is what, what we have here. Um, it's not particularly, Rare, it's not as common as some other configurations, but front and back uh, duplexes uh, happen in Arlington. Um, and so the issue really is once you, once you know that it is more 750 feet or more, the then you ask the questions on the, on the criteria. And the, the neighbors have made their case uh, that they do not believe that this is consistent with their community, whether or not this kind of format is used on other streets and in other neighborhoods, they don't feel that it's consistent with theirs. And they're not very happy about uh, the precedent that they opposed a number of years ago being used to justify doing the same thing and a concern that it would be done on other similar things so that it would lead to a, a larger change in the neighborhood. That's a point, and that and and they may be right about that, and it's going to be up to us when we apply the criteria uh, to decide whether the planning department is more nearly right or whether the feelings of the applicant are are more nearly right. But this is just what this is just what we do. There and uh, the the arguments that the that the Ms. Goldstein has made, that Mr. Rosenthal has made, um, Ms. Diamond has made uh, are. I mean, I, we, I, I think that they've made those, those, those fairly cogently. And the question now is, is just how does the commission come out on criterion number six? Uh, I do think that in terms of increasing traffic, one additional house on the street is, is likely to be de minimis. And I'm not very concerned about that one. Um, I'm a little bit, it's odd that we should be concerned about increase in stormwater management, but we have a whole other system besides the planning commission, or the, excuse me, the, the zoning board of appeals uh, for dealing with that. So it seems to me that there's really one overriding consideration in this case, and that is whether this is consistent with the character of the district or not. And we've heard, it, we've heard the positions of either side and we, we're gonna have to make up our minds what we think is right. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Okay. Um, um, may, may I just, uh, I've had my hand raised for a while. I was just turning to you, Mr. Rosenthal, please. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, there's been mention of residential design guidelines and what uh, is or is not in them. And I don't have that document. I would like to be able to review it myself. Do you know where I can get it? It is available. Um, from the planning department's website. Okay. All right, um, thank you. Certainly. Yes, yeah, doc, the, the document ID number is 54518. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that document ID number? Sure, it's 54518. Thank you. And um, if using the search feature on the town's website uh, with the terms residential design guidelines um, should surface the document. So, Mr. Chair? Mr. Revelak. Uh, as as uh, folks were talking, I downloaded a, the document from the town's website. And the, the part I had in mind when I spoke earlier was principle A2, uh, which appears on page 20. And what I, I think the way I was thinking of it, the principle itself is because rear yards are generally not visible from the street, they can be used in built to built into 
they can be used and built into in many ways. So where you know the typical um, you know where most sections in that document will focus on you know specific aspects and say do this, don't do that, or this is preferred, this is not preferred. You know the with respect to rear editions, they just said well there's 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 not more there's I, I think you know the guidelines are giving flexibility and not really making a lot of recommendations. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. If I could just, one thing that I think, and I, this was a concern actually uh, in the committee that developed the residential guidelines of which, uh, design guidelines of, on which I served. Um, but it's important to realize that these are a set of recommendations uh, that are for people to consider. Uh, they may have a bearing on our decision as to whether or not something is or is not consistent with the character of the district, uh, along with lots of other things. Uh, but it's important to know that they are not, and they are not intended to be a sort of substitute or additional right set of regulations that go beyond the zoning ordinance. Uh, what we've been talking, and so this isn't another place to comb, to comb uh, for here's a rule where they violate this rule, here's a rule they violate that rule. That It's not really intended to do that. And it has never been adopted by town meeting. It does not have the force of law. Uh, it's a series of, it's a way, it, it's intended to create a common way of thinking and talking about uh, design questions. And that's the way in which we are using it. And that's the way in which it's intended, it's intended to be used. Uh, that said, it's very useful, it seems to me for people applicants and others to be aware of, of what it says, uh, but uh, it's important to know what it is and what it isn't. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rosenthal, did you have anything further? Yes, I just wanted to respond, uh, given the section that Mr. Revelec just read, uh, the, particularly the clause, whereas rear yards are not generally visible from the street, I would like to emphasize what uh, Ms. Goldstein said and what I know from having driven and walked uh, up and down Mount Vernon Street myself. This will be visible from the street. Maybe not, you know, maybe not at a sit at a ninety degree angle. Maybe not if I'm standing in front of the house, looking straight at, you know, looking straight at the house. But if I'm standing in front of the house next door and looking at an angle, I'm gonna see it. It will be visible from the street. Thank you. Okay, and, and um, Mr. Chair, yeah. if, if with your permission, um, may I direct a question to either Ms. Goldstein or Mr. Rosenthal? And just, this is just for my personal understanding. In terms of what as I'm just was would like to understand what aspects of the proposed change uh, proposed addition you feel would not be keeping in the character. Um, you want me to answer that? Mm, okay. My view um, that the size first mm -hmm. of all, and the fact that it's a it, this isn't an addition. This is creating a second house that's bigger than the first house mm -hmm. onto the back of a house. So is every lot on Mount Vernon Street now going to capitalize on this and say, oh, I could build a million dollar house on the back of my house because I've got a deep lot. That's, that's one concern, the size and that that is going to change mm -hmm the character of this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and just while we're talking about the suggested guidelines, mm -hmm. you know, on page 33, they are saying, um, encourage smaller size, discourage oversized additions. Um, so I feel like that is what you experts should be taking into mm -hmm. consideration as well. And Mark perhaps has another answer to your question. Thank you. Sure. Um, so am, I mute, am I muted or- Nope, unmuted? you're fine. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I'm basically, it's, I, I don't know how to articulate this uh, clearly, but it's the feel of when we bought the house and ever since then up until the, what is it, 55, uh, 55 Mount Vernon edition, you know, w was turned from uh, one family into, you know, basically a second house was plunked into their backyard, leaving, um, you know, the world's tiniest backyard. Um, prior to that, you know, I could go into my backyard, and although I knew I was in residential Boston, um, and I, yes, I could see houses, um, at a certain distance from, you know, from where I was in my backyard, um, th there was a feel, a little bit of a feel that, you know, well, I can get away from the city and be a little bit in the country. Um, and suddenly with a, you know, with, with the second house in the backyard of, uh, of the 55, uh, Mount Vernon property, um, the trees are gone. Uh, you know, it's, it's no longer, I mean, I mean, it's not, you know, yes, I can look in different directions and, um, you know, and not see this additional house there. Um, but if that happens to every other R2 in, in the district, um, it's going to feel like basically Northeast Philly where I grew up and not like Arlington where I chose to move to uh, because to a great extent uh, that it was halfway between city and country. It was, you know, it wasn't Concord, but, and it wasn't downtown Boston, it was something in between. Um, it's not the, uh, you know, it, Yes, you expect uh, things to change over time, but this I, I see as potentially a very radical change. Thank you. I just, in the background here, I'm looking at the zoning map to sort of get a sense for the neighborhood in terms of um, what would be allowed, what would not be allowed. Um, all very odd. Um, so to, to, to the question about like all the other houses, so the so this side of, um, let me go ahead and share this, it's bizarre. Uh, so the property here is, um, is highlighted, this property here. So the darker yellow is two family and the, so the lighter tone is single family. Um, so presently, almost every single house that could be two family is a two family right now on this side of the street. Um, and that's the only reason that they're able to proceed in this fashion is that they do have a single family house in a two family district. Um, so this is the house next door that's basically two houses on the lot. Um, and they sort of go down the street. Um, 53 Mount Vernon, I'm not. I can't tell if it's single family or two family um, because it hasn't been condoed. If it's been condoed, you can usually tell. But 49.51, so that's a double, 45.47. So I, in, in some respect, I think this is sort of the last, the last one of those that can still um, be converted at this stage. And then the, the few on the back side on Walnut Street, 5860 is already a two family, 5456 is two, and 5052. So um, I think this is sort of the, the outlying parcel in that regard. Um, well, I, it, it might be, but if you look at Walnut Street, I think you see a lot of deep lots there with single family houses. So. Yeah. But the only ones that can be converted to two family 
our two families at this stage. All the other ones are unable to be converted because they're only a single family home. I, I would like to suggest that you're not thinking like a very creative developer would think. All the single families could easily, or uh, I'm sorry, all the two families could easily be turned into single families just by eliminating one entrance and um, <clears throat> and putting in an additional stair staircase. That would then mean that you now have a, sing a one family where there was, it was previously a two family unit, which would then, if this precedent is set, um, allow them to plunk yet another structure in, you know, behind the current structure. So the, the tools that are in the zoning bylaw to limit the size of a structure on a property, um, there's a couple of different criteria. One is lot coverage, that you can only cover a certain percentage of the lot. And the other is that you are required to provide usable open space, which is an open space area, which is a certain percentage of the gross floor area of the home, which is the interior space of the home. And those sort of limit the, the density on the property. Um, so under the, under the bylaw, it is possible to build larger than this, um, I believe. Whether that's a good idea or not, you know, is not before us today. Um, but I, I think the board is, is well informed of the neighbors' opinions on this matter. Um, and I would, I would like to, um, to allow the board to move on so that we can discuss the, um, how we would like to proceed. So in, Mr. Rosenthal, unless you have anything in addition, I would like to, to bring the public no, comment here to close. That's fine. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so I will bring public comment to a close. So coming back to the board. So we have before us is a large addition um, where we have information from the planning department. We have, and we have information from the abutting residents. Um, And we need to come to a, a decision about the what we believe about this um, addition. So, what I was going to propose we do is we look at the seven criteria um, and just go through them in order, and then after after that, see where we are. Um, so. The seven criteria are as established under section 333 in the zoning bylaw, which parallel the criteria under state code. Um, so criteria number one, is the requested use permittable? And yes, it is. Um, it's permittable by a special permit in the R2 district. Uh, criteria number two, the public convenience slash welfare. Um, So the, um, I'm, I'm looking at the planning boards. I don't have the actual question. Just that. There we go. Explain why the requested use is essential or desirable to, comp to the public convenience or welfare. And the, the planning department is that the proposal would create an additional housing unit. Um, and I guess the question is, does the board have any comments on that point? Seeing none. Criteria three, undue traffic congestion, impairment of public safety. 
uh, the question, explain why the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or unduly impair pedestrian safety. Um, so we're not, the applicant is not planning, is not adding an additional um, curb cut, is not creating an additional driveway. Um, there will obviously be additional cars because of the, the second unit, but it is in keeping with the the current residential pattern of that neighborhood, I don't think it's creating anything beyond the amount of traffic that someone would anticipate for a project like this. Uh, criteria number four, um, to explain why the requested use will not overload any public water drainage or sewer system or any other municipal system to such an extent that the requested use or any developed use in the immediate area or any other area of the town will be unduly subjected to hazards affecting health, safety, or the general welfare. And I think this is typically a, applied if the project was of such a scale that it would overwhelm the storm sewer system or it would um, require additional sewer capacity by the town or additional water capacity by the town. Um, the addition of one unit um, will not create an undue burden. Um, the planning department did comment that the addition will expand the footprint of the structure by 923 square feet into the rear yards, which is currently paved with bituminous concrete and has a garage. Part of the addition, the applicants would remove the existing garage structure. The engineering division should review stormwater analysis report for the proposal to determine whether the addition will increase the surface water runoff rate relative to the pre-development runoff rate for Article 15. So that's, a, as Mr. Valerelli had alluded, that is a requirement that they will have to um, pursue as a part of the permitting process. Um, criteria number five, special regulations. Um, um, describe how any special regulations for the use as may be provided in the zoning bylaw, including but not limited to the provisions of section eight are fulfilled. Um, so there are no additional zoning uh, requirements. As Mr. Moore pointed out, there are requirements under the general bylaws under the, the with the provisions for trees um, and that will need to be reviewed by um, by the applicant, by the town upon the application. Uh, criterion number six, which I think is the one we're gonna get hung up on here is explain why the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts, nor be detrimental to the health and welfare. Um, and so I think this is the one where the massing comes into question. The statement from the planning board as well. The proposal will substantially increase the structure's massing. The addition will be completely within the rear yard of the property. The appearance of the home from the street will not be altered, and the applicants note that the materials selected for the addition are comp complementary to the existing structure. The proposal is consistent with neighborhood character and is not detrimental to health, morals, or welfare. I think this is the, the point that the board needs to, to really consider as to what their opinion is on this Mr. Chairman, yes, please. Um, I just want to emphasize, I mean, just just in terms of going through the the very next one. I mean, this one is critical, as I think we discussed earlier. Uh, the next one is also relevant potentially, and that is uh, the detrimental excess and a particular use here. The use that is being challenged is a certain way of of essentially creating a two-family structure, um, and part of the argument is that. Uh, if we allow this, then there will be several other places where you could have similar conversions and that that would mean that not only do you have this one structure to look at, but that uh, the nature of the whole street is, is likely to change. Uh, that we may or may not agree with that, but that is a contention that would in, involve uh, Criterion 7. Well, thank you. So then the 
this is what brings the question back before the board is to is the requested addition in keeping with the with the neighborhood or is it unduly large chairman <clears throat> yes mr dupont so similar to the application that was uh, before us uh, tonight in front of this um, I think that the concerns that neighbors express about size, about massing, are worth considering. And I do think that the neighbors have expressed their opinions cogently, as Mr. Hanlon had pointed out. And once hearing them, I feel in order to reflect upon them more carefully, uh, and again, this is my personal opinion, it would be helpful for me to have more time to take a look at the street again. I mean, I looked at it, but then when I hear what the neighbors have to say, I think that that adds uh, additional information that I would like to be able to consider. And I don't know if the rest of the board feels that way, and I'm willing to go along with the rest of the board if people decide they want to proceed tonight, but I do feel in deference to the comments by the neighbors and without prejudice to the applicant, I would like to have uh, more time. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. How do other members of the board feel? <clears throat> Mr. Revlak. Mr. Chair, would it be possible to put up you know, as I'm thinking, in, in addition to the addition that's being proposed, uh, there's there will also be the removal of a garage that's um, and the removal of a, a fairly big deck. And I'm just wondering if it's possible, could we just flip back and forth between, so I'm looking here for, I'd like two sheets, one to show the you know, the proposed changes and one with the, you know, as the existing site as is. So, I mean, what, I, what I'm thinking is, yes, we're, yes, there is an addition, but there's also stuff coming off. And I'm wondering how that, you know, try, I'm trying to picture how that nets out, essentially. Sure. So the, the applicant is, so this is the existing site plan um, with the existing garage to be removed. The, applicant has indicated that this rear line of the garage is to be the, the rear line of the new addition, um, which you can see here. So that's the, I believe that is this, yeah. So it's this position here. And then there's a, the deck extends an eight feet beyond the, that edge. Um, so the existing, so this is, What's existing to so the garage would sit closer to um, the downhill side of the property, to closer to 55 on uh, the porch that wraps around on that side as well. And then the addition here, which peaks around the corner of the house in this position, um, stays behind the, the the setback, the, there are stairs that come out slightly on the side. And then on this side, it does sit slightly proud of the existing building. It is there, but it is slightly behind the, mm -hmm. but is hidden behind the bay. Or excuse me, the bow. No, it's the bay. Yeah, and just um, if, if I may, what's the distance? For, so it's 100, it's 72 feet from the rear property line to the back of the proposed addition? That is correct. And how? what is the distance between the rear property line and the rear of the existing garage? It is also 72 feet. It is also 72 feet. OK, and thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. And then this, this line here, which is sort of the transition between where the driveway is and the backyard, that line is obviously moving back so that there's more paved area at the rear because the, the lot isn't sufficiently wide to allow um, 
parking to come in from the side. So the parking is coming, is looping around and coming in from the rear. Looking again, so this um, just a, a question for Mr. Whitney. Um, so it appears that the the walk up entrance to the to this rear unit is is it from the deck? Is that correct? Correct. Those stairs lead up to the deck, and then the door to the new unit is from that deck. Okay. So you cannot you cannot find see the entrance to the back unit from the street. Correct. Mr. Valarelli, are you aware of any policy from the emergency services in regards to being able to locate units? No, uh, what they will have to do again, part of the um, plan review process, they'll have to register with engineering. Okay. Creating a new address. Uh, okay. So that's a great point. So in case of an emergency situation, the emergency vehicle will have to know where it's going because it will not show up on the map until the project is underway. And that's an engineering process. Okay. But there's no requirement that it have an entrance that is visible from the street? There is none to my knowledge. Okay. Mr. Mills, I believe you had a I agree um, with Mr. DuPont's comment. I'd like to have some a chance to consider this longer and actually take a stroll by the street, take a look at the perspectives from the neighborhood and uh, what this massing could appear to be like in a local perspective. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. I think that with this number of people who would just like a little more time uh, uh, to consider it and, and I'm guessing to go and visit. So th this will certainly be generating a considerable amount of pedestrian traffic over the next week or two. Um, <laughs> it might be helpful to, if, if I, I think that we'll be more comfortable with the decision uh, there's lots and lots of variations, and I usually find that when I have to think on my feet uh, in this particular kind of way, uh, I often regret what I, what I, the conclusion I come to. So uh, it would be nice. I, I'm not sure to what extent there are considerations that haven't been brought up, but figuring out how they all fit together, uh, what, what, for example, we make of the fact that there's still a 72 foot, foot rear yard. Uh, when we're talking about massing issues, how important is it that to look at the vision view from the front rather than other kinds of views? Just, just I mean, to following up on the chairman's count of the number of uh, single families available to do conversion, how much of an issue is it that this might spread and and cause a, a a larger change in the neighborhood than just this one property? All of these things have to be thought about and put together. And it seems to me that uh, it would be helpful to us uh, to be able to uh, take a little more time, go out and look and be able to reflect a little more deeply on the issues that have been brought up. I wonder, Mr. Whitney, would it be possible to, to schedule a time to go out there and actually be able to be on the property and see exactly what, 
the extent of the proposed additions? Sure, absolutely. And I say that without consulting the homeowners, but I'm sure they'd be open to it. I don't know if the homeowner's on the call or not. They are. Mr. Pappas. Yes. Mr. Pappas, would it be acceptable to, to do that? Yes, it would. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, how, how should we go about scheduling that? Um, we could try to set something up now if people have calendars or we can um, send around a, an, an email to try to work that out. Mr. Valerelli, would it be acceptable for us to send an email to verify that? It most certainly would, absolutely. Okay. Mr. Chairman, is that an open meeting law issue? So it depends on what we, I think we can, we have to be careful about that. Um, but I think if we were to sort of spread it out a little bit, I think we could make it work, but we would not be able to all go on mass. But I think if we were to go sequentially and look independently, I think that that's, that's acceptable under the public meeting law. But I'll, I'll confirm that. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I believe that, and just based on some other things that we've done in connection with, with uh, the residential study group and, and, and other things, a lot depends upon what you say when you get together. So, you know, if, if, we go, if we all went there together and we all agreed to talk about nothing but uh, caviar and champagne, uh, we would not be in any danger of violating the open meeting law, but this is probably not an occasion where we can have a back and forth and actually discuss the matter. We would have to hold our peace until uh, we had an opportunity to do that in, in a public meeting. Okay. okay. Um, in that case, if the board is amenable, I will um coordinate with mr whitney to uh find a time that people can come by and take a look um and then but then we would still need so we would need to continue um tonight to a date certain um So with that is the plan that I will coordinate um, a time to visit the site with the applicant's architect and um, would we want to continue to a date certain of um, also of April 13th? Yep. No objection. No objection. Is that date available for the applicant? It is for me. This is okay. Mr. Whitney speaking. Okay. So then, um, may I have a motion to continue? So moved. And continuing to date, date certain of April 13th at 7.30 p.m. So then. Moved by Mr. DuPont. Was that Mr. Mills who seconded? Yes. Okay, uh, taking the rolls. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. And the chair says aye. So we are continued on this until April 13th at 7.30 p.m. So that moves us to the next item on our agenda. Thank you, members of the board. You're Thank welcome. You. Welcome, Mr. Whitney. You're welcome, sir. Um, 
the next item on our agenda is the end of the meeting. So thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. We appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially wish to thank Mr. Valorelli and Mr. Lee for their assistance in preparing for and hosting the online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's reporting this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Mr. Moore? Uh, this is Steve Moore again. Um, just one comment I'd like to make. I've now participated in a bunch of these meetings. And I just want to say, uh, you folks, uh, do great work, and I don't think I'd want your jobs for the. <laughs> um, um, this is this is it's it's tough what you do. You're trying to balance so much, and 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 keeping your head so much to do with zoning, which of course is never changing, ever sh morphing, changing shape. So I just want to thank you for the work that you do. This is this is hard. This is hard stuff. And um, I think a little more caviar and champagne probably is. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Moore. That's you. very gracious. Thank Thanks. you. Appreciate that, Mr. Moore. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we could have a motion to adjourn. So moved. So move, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Second. No. Nope. Mr. Ravlock beat you to it. All those board members in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for your participation tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Everyone. Appreciate it. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, gents.